So today's motion is North Korea and South Korea want reunification. We will now start the initial vote. Um, you should see in just a few seconds on your screen um, a question whether you agree with the motion, whether you disagree with the motion, or whether you don't know. Um, and you have about a minute to answer that question. Um, while you do that, as a reminder, the two countries never actually signed a peace treaty. After the Korean War, uh, which started 70 years ago, the armed conflict just ended in an armistice. This war was very devastating for both sides with the death of millions of civilians and destructions throughout the whole peninsula. The two countries have since developed in almost opposite directions, with South Korea being a recognized and respected democracy, both regionally and globally, and a member of the G20, while the North remains one of the world's most isolated countries a dynastical communist regime that is internationally both feared for its nuclear capacity um, and worried about how its citizens are doing now in the future. Um, so two very, very different countries that are still looking at potentially reunifying at some point. Um, time is running out on the poll. Um, it seems that most of you have voted. If you didn't, um, you have five more seconds to do so, and then I will close the poll. Thank you very much. I'm now ending the poll. Um, and we will not share the results at this point, but we'll wait until the end. So here we are today um, to talk about the potential future of the Korean Peninsula. Um, for this purpose, we are very excited that our guests have agreed to take part in this debate. Let me introduce now our teams. And I would ask the panelists to turn on their video cameras for this uh, so we can actually see them. So first, arguing for the motion, uh, Dr. Chiang Lee, Joining us from Washington, D.C. today, an associate professor at the School of International Service and C.W. Lim and Korea Foundation Professor of Korean Studies at the American University in Washington, D.C. Um, and joining her to argue for the motion is John Delury, uh, who joins us from South Korea. He's a professor of Chinese studies and chair of international cooperation program at Yonsei University in Seoul. Um, he's also a senior fellow um, of the Asia Society and Pacific Century Institute and a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, um, National Committee on US-China Relations, and National Committee on North Korea. Um, Jiang and John, welcome uh, to this debate. On the other side, arguing against the motion, we have uh, Dr. Sandra Fahey, who is joining us from Boston, an associate professor of anthropology in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and the graduate program in Global Studies at Sofia University, Tokyo. Um, and she's currently working at Harvard Law's Human Rights Program as a visiting fellow. And finally, um, on the team arguing against the motion, Stephen Denny, um, postdoctoral research fellow in the Innovation Policy Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto, where he's also joining us from, and a senior policy analyst at the Brookfield Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Thank you all very, very much for being with us here today. Um, and without further ado, I would now ask uh, Jiang Li to start us off with her opening remarks, arguing in favor of the motion that North and South Korea actually want to reunify. Jiang, you have four minutes. Thank you. Good morning from Washington, D.C. Thank you, Asia Society, for this kind invitation and all of you who joined today. Let me open this debate by presenting three key arguments for the motion. One, the Koreans want unification because they want to end a constant threat of war. After nearly 67 years since the signing of an armistice, um, we know how unnatural it is for them to remain um, still technically at war. North Korea has developed nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction capabilities and their delivery systems, threatening the peace of the Korean Peninsula um, and the entire world, gaining the reputation for being a rogue state. I would argue that for the long-term peace and stability of the Korean Peninsula, the best option and probably the only lasting viable option is to take steps towards unification gradually. In his book, The Two Koreas Don't Have a Duffer, once described Korea as a country of the wrong size in the wrong place, regardless whether or not you agree with this characterization. Um, it is true that Korea is at a geographical location where Chinese, Japanese, Russian, and American geostrategic interests intersect. 
for the national security of the two Koreas and in the grand scheme of the things, it serves them better to be united, unified, rather than divided, fighting with one another. Second, while acknowledging that there is a concern um, for about the economic, financial, and social burdens associated with the unification. However, I would argue that benefits outweigh the costs. Unification will undoubtedly be painful and expensive, especially in the short term. However, reliable data suggests that the standard of living on the Korean Peninsula overall will rise, especially in the long term. And there are other economic considerations coming from rich natural resources that support the forward motion, such as coal, iron ore, rare earth metals, um, and also population increase from North Korea will be a plus. Importantly, there is also peace dividend savings from not having to spend so much on defense. Last but not least, I believe that the two Koreas one unification for the happiness of Koreans. We know that a unified Korea will be better for many Koreans, especially North Koreans for, who suffer from the various types of human rights violations. Uh, personally, I was encouraged by the recent survey of um, the South Korean youth uh, in their, those who are in junior high and high school. Um, um, and they actually think about 30% actually said that unification is necessary because that's going to help Korea to become stronger. And about 23% answered that it will ease security concerns of the Korean Peninsula and about 20% cited that the Koreas have the same ethnic roots. So I actually agree with these views. And um, I'm not suggesting that the two Koreas should unify right away tomorrow, but I would argue that they should move towards that direction. And I'll stop here. Thank you very, very much, ji um, for this fantastic opening statement. Um, let me turn it right over uh, to Sandra Fahi, who's going to deliver the opening statement arguing against the motion, and she also has four minutes for that. Sandra, please. Thank you, Nico and Asia Society and uh, Serena for all of your hard work in organizing this. It's my pleasure to be here, and thank you so much. Um, okay, so the argument that North and South Korea want to reunify is fundamentally flawed because it's at odds with reality. The two states exist as separate, independent, sovereign states because each does not accept the political governance of the other for itself. But let's not mistake this for one viewing the other as the legitimate Korea. So let me begin with a question. If it is true that North and South Korea want to reunify, then why haven't they done so? The simple answer is that each Korea has a different version of what reunification would be. For the South, a reunified peninsula would be democratic and free. There would be rule of law and an open market. The most basic freedoms, such as freedom of movement, association, and expression would be protected. It would be South Korea, only bigger, with more people, more land, and more resources. Yes, more poverty and an unworldly, malnourished, and politically stunted northern population. In other words, a complete fantasy. Because who can reunify with a dictator? Nobody, unless you play by a dictator's rules. Why is this version of reunification so unpalatable to North Korea? And as you can hear, my cat also finds it very unpalatable. Um, <laughs> Despite its name, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea is neither democratic nor a republic, nor is its leadership chosen by fair and just elections. North Korea cannot survive its current political, in its current political manifestation if it deigns to uphold freedom of movement, association, and expression. Why? Because North Koreans would then be able to compare the lies with reality. 
North Korea operates with an ideology that if they evades responsibility for its political, economic, and social failures. Who wants to reunify with a dictator? Such reunification happens by force. And if something happens by force, then it is not wanted. We know that the public opinion polls from South Korea say that there are some who support reunification based on a common ancestry, but this is a small number and it's dwindling. Similarly, those who wish to reunify without conditions are even smaller. At best, South Koreans will reunify with North Korea under the right conditions, but those conditions don't exist and are unlikely to exist anytime soon. And what do North Koreans want? Well, their society is unfree and controlled, so we have no idea. We've seen reunification before, actually. On June 25, 1950, North Korea under Kim Il-sung invaded the South. The goal was to reunify the country. That attempted reunification lasted three years, and it's called the Korean War. That attempted reunification killed 2.5 million people. It brought global powers to the peninsula, the Soviet Union, China, the United States, and the UN. A million combatants were killed. That attempted reunification ended where it began, minus millions of lives, with two hostile states either side of the 38th parallel. That reunification was fought back and ended with an armistice. In other words, South Korea rejected what North Korea wanted. To reiterate, the argument that North and South Korea want to reunify is fundamentally flawed. It's at odds with reality. There may be those who insist North Korean style of confederation formulated by Kim Jong-un, such as Moon Jae-in, but as we splendidly saw and found out with the PRC in Hong Kong, you only have one country and two systems. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra, and thank you very much to Sandra's cat as well for um, joining the argument there. Um, and we're gonna move it right along for a rebuttal statement from the team arguing in favor of the motion, John Delury in South Korea. The floor is yours for also four minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Nico. I, I don't have a cat to back me up. There are some children running around who, who may uh, choose to participate and be heard. Sandra makes, uh, as expected, some great points, and I'll try to uh, comment on or, or even rebut maybe them partially. But I think, as often happens with these debates, what you have to do in the rebuttal is to go back to the original proposition and, and look at the question, remind ourselves what's the question we're asking. Uh, and, and the question under debate is, do North Korea and South Korea want reunification? Sandra made a very important point, which is that you know reunification means different things to different people. It means different things in the North and in the South. But I would argue that is precisely why the answer to the question is yes. Since the moment of division and down to the current day, both North Koreans, uh, certainly as a state, which we know more about, and to some extent people, which Sandra Vault, of, of anyone knows, we know more than she is admitting. She, uh, she's one of the leading scholars on what, what we know about North Korea. So we have some sense of what North Koreans want. And here in the South, where we know a lot about what the state says it wants and what the people want, down to the present day, you have an almost universal, universal affirmation that division is unacceptable, that this is an abnormality of history, which it is. If you look at a thousand years, the last thousand years of Korean history, the steady state of the Korean peninsula is to be one thing. And even after this long extended anomalous period, 70 years of division, Koreanness exists. And the differences in North and South have not effaced or eviscerated an underlying unity. You can taste it because if you eat food in North Korea, you know it's Korean food, like in the South. Uh, you can hear it because the language that you hear in North Korea, while it has interesting, you know, patois and differences, is fully mutually intelligible with the language in the South. Uh, on so many levels, and these are not superficial levels. These are reflected in the customs of people, the manners of people, the way that family dynamics work, despite the profound differences in the political systems. And as Nico said from the beginning, you could hardly imagine 
two political trajectories, two ideologies that hit, and two economies that have moved in more radically divergent directions than North Korea and South Korea, despite that, and despite this extended anomalous period, Koreanness exists. And both sides as states, and I would wager as people, I'm confident having spent 10 years in the South, I'm confident, uh, harder to know in the North, but I'm confident in the South that the people as well, when you say, do they want reunification, flip it around. I dare you to ask almost any South Korean, including my students who are the ones who statistically have the highest level of ambivalence about unification. They, for good reason, they worry about the costs. They worry about the political differences that Sandra brought up. Nonetheless, even them, you ask them, do you want permanent division of the Korean Peninsula? Is that acceptable? Is that the future you want for yourself, for your children, for your grandchildren? It's very hard to find a Korean. And I, I think this would be true in the North. And I know it's true in the South. And the state in the North and the state in the South have never to this day said division is acceptable. And so how we get there uh, is hard to imagine and we're not close under current conditions, it's unimaginable. But that both sides want it and that they must find a way uh, is true. Thank you, Nico, I think my time is up. Excellent, thank you so much, John. Um, you were right on time. Um, thank you very much for this rebuttal. Um, and we're now gonna hear uh, finally from Stephen Denny um, who's going to deliver the rebuttal against the motion before we move into Q&A. If you already have questions now, please do submit them uh, using the Q&A function and then we can address them in the Q&A starting after Stephen's rebuttal. Stephen, you have four minutes, please. Thanks, Nico. Thanks to my debating compatriots and everyone joining us here today. I agree with John that we need to bring this back to the question, to the, to the resolution that North and South Korea want reunification. And what I'm going to do now is to convince you that South Koreans, at least, do not actually want reunification, despite what we hear and what we are told both in this debate um, and in other parts of South Korean society uh, and beyond. Uh, what I'm going, the case I'm going to lay out here is that South Koreans, uh, the people specifically, because I know there's some question, are we talking about the government? Are we talking about the people? Let's focus on South Korea. The people of South Korea, under the conditions that currently exist, which are going to determine whether or not reunification is actually preferred and wanted, do not want this. And the South Korean government, being responsive to the people as a republic, uh, must respect those preferences. So before I address some of the good points that have been raised um, by the opposition, I want to make uh, I want to lay out a really clear case for why the South Korean people do not actually want reunification. The first is this. The, the political culture of South Korea has shown that over the last 25 to 30, maybe 40 years, the period that basically covers most of South Korea's um, de uh, democracy or its democratization after 86, 87, 88 through the, through the transition, uh, that there has been um, arising a South Korea specific national identity that is divorced from the politics of ethnic nationalism and the idea of pan-Koreanism, the idea of this Hanmin joke idea that, this, that there is a North and South Korea that must naturally be together. That is the language and the logic of ethnic politics, which was very popular during the authoritarian era and remains popular in North Korea in large part because it's an authoritarian regime which bases its legitimate claims to government, mainly in ethnic terms. I would like to underscore that the logic uh, that the opposition has laid out here and these ideas that John was getting thinking about are completely uh, driven and motivated by ethnic nationalism. This idea that North Koreans and South Koreans are one and that what defines you as a Korean today is your ethnicity. That idea is one, not compatible with democracy because it excludes and two, is not actually bought in by South Koreans. South Korean Democrats, small d, uh, they are less likely to view North Koreans in kinship terms, do not support unification, not at least under radically different conditions, which as Sandra said, and I'll just allude to that, do not actually exist, uh, and view North Korea with relative hostility, especially, but not exclusively men. Third point, 
evidence from unification in action, which is the resettlement of North Korean defector migrants into South Korea, suggests that it is not really preferred either. The North Korean migrants themselves, uh, the North Korean migrants themselves uh, will tell you, and as I think all the, the panels here have spoken with, that they feel like second class citizens that despite being told by the constitution and sort of discourse at large that they belong to the same nation do not actually belong to the same nation. Um, and South Koreans uh, as well largely view them as a different group within society. Um, so to recap here, um, although it would eliminate the threat of war, it would require a giving up of South Korea's uh, liberal democracy. That is what would be required of South Korea in order to unify. And that is mainly to Jiang's point. Second to John's, which is that underneath all of this, they still want it. No, they don't actually. That is driven by an ethnic nationalist discourse that has fallen by the wayside and, and, and replacing it in, in a steed is a democratic, more inclusive South Korea specific national identity and new discourse. I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Stephen, um, for this final rebuttal, um, which brings us to the Q&A with, with all the participants. So if I could just ask all the panelists um, to come back. Uh, I, I know you're not gone, but to turn back on your, your video and audio so we can, we can talk about that. Um, the things that you said, and again, to the audience uh, listening in, if you do have more questions, there are a few great ones already submitted. Uh, please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your stream. Um, I'm going to start with, with Jiang and John, um, who were arguing in favor of the motion. Um, your opponents, I think, made a very, very good point, which is that these are two fundamentally different political systems and that any form of reunification would be very hard just from this. Um, Stephen said, not just authoritarianism and democracy are incompatible, but this, the ethnic nationalism, um, in, his, in his view, driving sort of uh, reunification wishes would also be incompatible with democracy. So to the team arguing for the motion, I know you said reunification is not around the corner, but if it were to happen, what shortly, briefly would have to be the conditions that would have to be met for reunification to actually move forward? Uh, maybe John, if you want to start us off. Well, um, sure. I mean, to make this dramatic, uh, I, I can imagine a Vietnamese style reunification, which would be uh, by war. Now, Sandra can argue, as she did, that's an that's a interesting argument that if it's uh, if military force is involved, um, it's not choice on one side, um, but that would still answer your question and that would get you a, a reunification of the peninsula. Um, uh, you know, you're there in Switzerland, there is endless discussion uh, in Korea of the German model. That's kind of the preferred of many uh, South Koreans, um, kind of the ideal version would be, of course, it's imagine the South as North Korea collapses and is, is somehow gently peacefully absorbed, um, you know, by, by the South. Uh, so those would be two models. And then the third one is the hardest. I think it's the one Ji Young and I have in mind, maybe she wants to say, uh, but it, it can't happen soon. And it is a sort of re reintegration um, that's predicated on decades more of profound changes to the political economy, to the society of North Korea, um, and also a level of interaction that the two Koreas have been denied, except for very brief moments in their history, have been denied. And so the, uh, the result of, um, of increased inter-Korean activity would generate its own kind of dynamics. Uh, but that is not a short-term model of reunification. I think it is the model that she and I have in mind in our argument. ji Young, would you wanna, do you wanna add something? I think John made a great point and I agree with uh, his point. Um, to provide my uh, reaction to um, actually Sandra's excellent point, I would argue that to think that the current reality will continue forever, I think it's a flawed logic. Um, so we're gonna have to come up with good policies to be able to shape the reality towards the direction where the people uh, of the two Koreas will actually find um, 
um, serve their interests. And to uh, respond to Stephen's excellent point about the uh, from uh, identity argument, um, I think when we actually go down, break down of the ambivalence that Koreans feel towards unification, um, I agree that uh, people are actually less tied to this ethnicity-based argument. Uh, recently, I actually saw a data published by Seoul National University. They actually have conducted a um, survey uh, since 2007 in terms of uh, various breakdowns of you know, the conditions under which people might want to proceed with unification. The feeling that I get from the data is that people have moved towards much more practical outlook on unification questions. So most recently, 2019 data suggest that about 61%, actually higher than ever, are wanting, they're, they're actually singing, South Koreans are singing the benefits of unification um, uh, than actually ever before. So those are something to keep in mind. I actually really like to highlight how um, it's a different question, how we're going to go about unification. Um, it's a separate question than whether um, they want unification. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Jiang, you and John both have sort of used, um, you know, sort of public sentiment in, in different groups in South Korea as, as part of your argument. Uh, Stephen, on the other hand, has also argued um, sort of with how South Koreans feel. Uh, it seems to me that, that the piece we're missing here, of course, is how North Koreans feel. And, and, and by that, I don't mean the government, you know, I mean actual people. Um, there's a great point that's being made by one of our listeners. Um, that, of course, the answer to the question we're debating here may depend on whether we mean the governments of the respective countries or its populations, and those may not necessarily agree. And so I'm just going to address this question, uh, which comes from the audience, uh, to you, Sandra. Um, what, if anything, do we know um, about the attitudes of North Korean people towards reunification and whether there are any changes in terms of demographics or, or, or generations uh, to, to that attitude. So how do North Koreans feel about reunification? Is, is that sentiment changing in some way? Um, thank you, Nico. And I love that question. It's a great one. And perhaps in answering it, I can also respond a bit to um, John's points and ji points. You know, division is something that is um, unwanted by both Koreas. I mean, in fact, if we were to have a debate about that, um, you know, Delory and Dr. Lee would be correct. I mean, it is rejected, it is not wanted. Um, I had the, a great opportunity to speak recently with um, Mr. Oh, the young defector who crossed and was shot at 15 times by his former colleagues as he defected into South Korea. I had a chance to meet him in Washington, D.C. And uh, he was saying the following things. He said, you know, sometimes life is so difficult in North Korea that we almost wanted war to break out so that it would put an end to the difficulty of our lives. And I asked him, um, did you want to win the war? And he said, yes, we did. We want to win the war. Um, and I said, well, then you would be just as bad off <laughs> as you were before it. Um, you know, what, what did you think of that? And he said, oh, no, 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 we would have the resources of South Korea that would make us wealthy. And I said to him, well, um, North Korea has a lot of resources. The resource it doesn't have is democracy and uh, human rights. And that is why it is a poor country. That is why um, you know, it can't steal the riches of South Korea's uh, democracy. And that is what make, will make the entire peninsula impoverished if it is unified under the North Korean state. So I, I would just say that there hasn't been a lot of studies done on what North Koreans think of reunification when they were back in North Korea. So if anybody's listening who's a student, this work needs to be done. South Koreans often ask North Koreans, what do you think of unification? But that's when they're in South Korea. And of course they want it under, North, under South Korean style. All right, thank you very much. And, and let me maybe just follow up um, with the argument you made, which is of the economic argument. Now, uh, Jiang, you mentioned that, you know, in case of reunification, the economic benefits would outweigh the costs. And I want to point to a question um, also from the audience that references the German example, where, of course, reunification was between countries who were economically much, much, much closer, even though there were huge disparities, but they were much closer uh, 
um, together than North and South Korea are. So would a reunification not put an incredibly undue burden um, on South Korea's economy were it to happen? Can you explain to us why you think the benefits are, are higher than the costs? Sure. Um, I think my qualifying statement to that will be um, to have a long-term perspective. Short term, I'm sure it's going to be expensive. It will require a lot of um, resources on the part of South Koreans to be able to actually fund that unification, not just financially, socially, culturally, it's going to be a very expensive endeavor. Having said that though, um, this data is actually about 10 years old. I was looking for more recent data, but wasn't able to find it. Um, about 10 years ago, Goldman Sachs had a um, research published that um, in about um, around, in about 30 years after unification, unified Korea's GDP will be actually equal or higher than France, Germany, and Japan. Again, I'm not an economist, but the, the documents and the data that I actually read um, in terms of long-term projection, even the scholar who made a prediction that the unification will cost about 10 trillion, in the long term, it will actually pay off. So I uh, actually think that it's a much better step towards making the step, uh, make, it's a better decision to make decision to move towards that direction for the long term um, projection rather than being caught up with the immediate uh, difficulties. Just because something's difficult doesn't mean that um, it's not possible. So. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, and, and I know Sandra, Sandra wants to respond to this. So Sandra, let me ask you, because I, I was going to ask the, the other team anyway. So Jung makes a very, I think, convincing point here. Um, this is about the long run. I also remember that there's uh, sometimes kind of like a, a discount being applied to the value of South Korean companies because of, you know, the, the, the threat of um, a, a war with the North. So it's, it's assuming you know that in the long run reunification would be economically uh, beneficial and it would remove this sort of um, this, uh, this this discount. Why are you so sure that reunification would be economically devastating or at least not beneficial? I am not sure, but what I am sure of is that um, North Korea doesn't want what South Korea has to offer. And in the underlying assumptions, and I receive these um, academic articles to peer review all the time that just make the assumption that by unification, we're talking South Korean style unification, um, you cannot reunify with an authoritarian regime. You can't. We, we saw what happened with China and Hong Kong. You will erode the basic rights and freedoms in South Korea. Samsung, LG, etc. they'll be gone. When we talk about the wealth of unification on the peninsula, we are talking about all of the South claiming what it has claimed for so long in its constitution, which is that the entire peninsula belongs to the ROK. Listen, I would love nothing more. <laughs> um, the problem is we have Kim Jong-un and his sister and several other cronies who absolutely don't want that because they live like kings. Let's, let's maybe play this also briefly back to the other team once uh, one more time uh, because I think you're, you're making an interesting point and the question came up in from audience uh, as well. John, obviously there is a scenario and, and you mentioned I think this before in, in your scenarios where reunification happens on completely South Korean's terms uh, because the North is just kind of collapsing. But let's assume that's not the case. To which extent do you see um, the potential within South Korea, both you know, in the general population as well, and the political elite for quote unquote compromise. So what is the political price South Korea would be willing to pay to achieve reunification? It seems hard to imagine, as Sandra has said, that there's anything beyond just absorption of the Northern territories into the South Korean system that would find a majority in, in, in today's South Korea. Yeah, I, I think that that's, um, that's probably right. I mean, uh, again, I'm focusing the debate. Uh, I wouldn't have accepted the terms of this debate if the verb want weren't in there. Uh, because 
uh, and this is the fundamental, there may not even be a disagreement in the sense that um, when I say they want reunification, um, they both want it on their terms. If we're focusing on the states now, and that is why it hasn't happened. Uh, and neither side is strong enough to coerce or force its own conditions on the other side. You know, another thing that is repeated too often is how the South is so much stronger than the North and, you know, the comparison with Germany and how the GDP is 40 or 50 or however many times bigger it is. One thing we should have learned by now about North Korea is to stop underestimating it, its strength, its resilience even. Um, it is the oldest state in this neighborhood and it has maintained its system despite the fact that we, how many times has been said, oh, it's heading for the dustbin of history. You can't have dynastic communism. You can't have this, you can't have that. They've survived famine. They've survived you know, being threatened, nuclear threats by the world's greatest superpower. So North Korea is incredibly strong in its own way. Uh, and it, but not strong enough to force reunification on its terms. And so you have this perpetual standoff. The point that we, to bring back to the debate, and this is maybe where we do disagree, because I believe this, both sides want it. They both want it on their terms. And to some extent, this is kind of a prolonged waiting game to see who can eventually do it on their terms. So when the discussion about reunification in the South, Nico, is not about, oh, well, we don't really need civil rights. And it's OK if we stop you know, voting. I mean, you talk about the current president, Moon Jae-in, who's sometimes accused of being you know, pro-communist. He was a student leader in the democracy movement that gave this place a real democracy. He and the people around him fully understand what democracy means. So the discussion about reunification doesn't get to that level you're talking about of, oh, we don't really need this degree of democracy here in the South. And that's precisely why there aren't terms under current conditions where it's imaginable that the reunification can happen. That's, uh, I, again, you're, you're making a very good point there, John, uh, by bringing us back sort of to the, the question of wanting reunification and necessarily of it happening. Um, it does seem to me that, as you said, there is disagreement, and, and I would love to throw this question to Stephen, who's, who's addressed this before. Um, and it seems to me, Stephen, that you were a lot more critical when it came to so quote unquote ordinary uh, South Koreans desire to reunify, no matter under which conditions, because you seem to argue that there's that there's already been a much larger, if you want, like cultural split between the two countries than than John led on in his opening statements. Um, is that the case? And do you think that gap is going to become wider over time, or is there a potential for it to narrow again? I believe the gap will become much wider. Um, I already think it's quite wide. Uh, there is a motivation among respondents in, say, surveys, polls, even in conversations to articulate a vision of the Korean Peninsula that is considered socially desirable. Um, but there's evidence, uh, some of which I have presented to the world, uh, which shows that uh, that is not actually reflected of true preferences. The true preferences, I think, are kind of nestled in what we might work describe as a very quiet revolution within South Korea. Nothing violent that overturns an existing social or political order, but something that is sort of chipped away at this idea, which is very much rooted in the ethnic nationalism of the past, that North and South Korea are one and therefore ought to be reunified, ergo unification is wanted. I think we can make a case. So to really bring this back, and I, this is, John's right about this. This is a debate, let's bring it back. And it really settles on this question of want. Sandra and I have made the case that the South Korean government, um, nor the North Korean government, neither want unification because the want here is not something that's actually achievable. And what's plausible or possible is something that neither side wants. That's why there hasn't been reunification. But if you don't accept that, um, because I mean, you can go to MOU statements, um, you can read North Korean propaganda, and you could read into that a desire or a want for unification. So if you don't accept that, I think then you, you have to then go to what the, what the South Korean people want. And it is a representative democracy. So the government is going to have to represent the, you know, the aggregate interests of the citizenry. 
And the South Korean people don't actually want reunification, at least nothing that resembles or comes close to um, reunification as we understand it. It would require sort of a, 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 a new reality. Um, and at some point we have to be reasonable with what someone can want. I mean, we all want a lot of things, pie in the sky, hopes and dreams, uh, you can want them. Um, is that actually reflective of a preference for something that is achievable, something that we could actually want? I don't think so. So I think from a government perspective, we can make a case that they don't want it. Uh, but if you don't accept that, the South Korean people, they, they don't want this. Uh, what they want is a prosperous South Korean democracy. And the evidence for that is all over your television. All right, thank you very much. We're almost um, at the end of the q and so Let me ask one final question to all of you. Um, uh, and it's not a question specifically about the reunification, but I thought it was interesting um, also coming from the audience. We mentioned at the beginning that the two countries actually never signed a peace treaty. It, there's an armistice, but not a peace treaty. So what are the chances in, in all of your views of there being a peace treaty that's not reunification? Would that be kind of like a, a middle way, a middle ground, a step closer, or maybe just a way for these two countries to more constructively and more peacefully coexist than they do now. Um, let's maybe start with, with John and Jiang and then hear from, from Sandra and Stephen afterwards. Um, okay, well, quickly, uh, they, they, you didn't point out, Nico, they didn't even sign the armistice. North Korea did, South Korea didn't sign the armistice. Uh, testament to how they insisted, uh, the government at that time insisted on reunification, wanted uh, reunification. Um, and wouldn't accept an armistice. So, um, you know, there are these problems. Can you sign a peace treaty when, you know, you've never really declared war? Even the United States didn't declare war. Um, so whether we get to a formal peace treaty, I'm pretty skeptical of that. I mean, there have already been signed documents, including recently, um, that you could interpret as, you know, at least affirmations of non-aggression and basically peaceful intention on the two sides. Uh, the, what it really comes down to is whether the leadership in, in both sides, and it's a reflective of a democratic society here and an authoritarian uh, system in the North, whether it's in their self-interest and they can carry through on uh, a serious path of, uh, of reducing the security tensions and building peace. And I certainly think that um, that's possible, but I don't think, I wouldn't really be looking for a declaration uh, as the key to do it. It would be a constant process uh, of taking those steps. And it would be, you know, the security side of what ji Yong and I are talking about, a very gradual process of reintegration uh, in which 30 years from now, we could all get back together and say, oh, actually, we can imagine now that the two Koreas are becoming one as they should because it's, it's happening. Conditions have changed so profoundly that it, it, we can imagine it. Thank you. Um, let me just quickly give the word to Sandra um, to respond to this question, but to also, I think, um, address an earlier argument from Chi Young on conflict and war. Sandra. Yeah, this is a very popular topic lately. Um, North Korea loves to talk about peace. North Korea loves to talk about peace. They love to write about peace, but they love to kill. Um, how peaceful is North Korea? Um, let's look at the last time the ROK and the U.S. resorted to military retaliation in the face of a North Korean lethal attack. So North Korea has lethally attacked many times throughout its history, and the ROK has not retaliated back. So ROK is peaceful. Uh, the United States, okay, we've got some issues, I admit, um, but um, there's that. In terms of North Korea's peace, um, you know, we had the Yangon bombing, Rangoon, in 1983, where they killed 17 Korean foreign officials, um, the 1987 airline bombing, um, the axe murder incident in 76, uh, the seizure of the Pueblo, um, uh, 1968 shot down a spy plane, I mean, on and on and on of North Korea um, taking actions, which I think are to goad uh, South Korea into uh, a, a, another war with them in the attempt to totally reunify. Mm -hmm. um, North Korea's raison d'etre is unification of the peninsula under its government system. It doesn't view South Korea as legitimate. A peace 
uh, treaty with North Korea would all just be talk again. Talk, talk, talk. Rhetoric is the most valuable resource North Korea has and operates and wields. And, uh, and it loves to do it. And it loves to do it to disseminate ideology internationally. A peace process? Let's talk about that. What is the human rights situation going to look like in North Korea under a peace process? People are against division, but, um, you know, they're against division because they don't have access to people inside North Korea. What about family unifications? Why can't we have that? If North Korea were to liberalize, entitle their people to have human rights where they can come and go and visit, then we can talk about unification. Then we can talk about people connecting genuinely, but it's not there. So uh, we can't talk about a peace process. You can't negotiate with a dictator. All right, um, thank you very much. Um, we have to move on to closing statements now. Um, each uh, person gets two minutes to sort of wrap up their argument. So this is your chance to convince the audience that uh, your view on the motion, and again, the motion is do North, North and South Korea actually want reunification um, is valid. We're gonna do this in the exact same order than we did in the beginning. Um, so Ji Young, um, the floor is yours for two minutes to summarize the argument and then we'll move on, please. Thank you for this great debate. Um, I guess my final point is actually reiterating a powerful question that was asked by um, John, basically who will want a permanent division of the Korean Peninsula? History, politics, ethnicity, culture, um, despite the alienation and confrontation, all point to how interconnected the two countries and peoples are. I think we should consider that unification is never a one-dimensional. Uh, we should start with a deep appreciation that it is going to be a remarkably complex matter. Based on this understanding, I think we, what we should keep in mind first and foremost is preparing these societies um, you know, towards unification is really for the peace, not the kind of peace uh, what um, Sandra just described, Pueblo and the, the, the bombing of Korean airliners in the 1980s, those are acts of terrorism, not peace. But towards the peace of the Korean Peninsula where people don't have to worry about, you know, the war is gonna break out, you know, in any time. Um, getting rid of that um, concern and the threat of constant, you know, possibilities of war that I think even with just that, I think exactly the reason why they do want both Korea's unification and the reason why we should stop, we should start moving towards that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ji Young. Uh, we're going to move us right along to Sandra Fahi uh, for her closing statement arguing against the motion. Oh, I'm unable to start video, but maybe I will just keep talking anyway. Oh, it says start my video. Okay, great. Um, well, um, what divides the people of Korea? South Koreans can come and go. Uh, they can live free. And they are not divided from family in the United States, Canada, even China, even Hong Kong, which, hmm. But North Koreans are the ones who are truly divided from the entire world. So what I would argue is that North Korea needs to unify with the world <laughs> by uh, advocating for human rights of its people. Let me just reiterate, the argument that North and South Korea want to reunify is fundamentally flawed. It's at odds with reality um, and authoritarianism eats democracy for breakfast. Absent a collapse of one of the most, uh, of one and the absorption of the other, we can't say that either wants to reunify. I'll leave it there, thanks. Um, you're all surprising me because you're not using your two minutes, um, but that's great. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so, so no, no, that's fine. That's fine. You get extra points for being short and concise. Um, John Delury, um, your closing statement arguing in favor of the motion, please. Oh, I thought you were going to say I get their extra time, but I guess that's <laughs> not Oxford rule. So let's break this down into the four levels: the state, uh, the North Korean state, and the North Korean people. So I'll quote Sandra. She just said that the raison d'etre of the North Korean state is reunification. So I'll rest the case there. I think we agree. Uh, and um, as far as the North Korean people, I think if we're honest, we have to say we don't know. So I don't think they can win the argument 
but frankly, neither can we. We, we don't know enough about what North Korean people uh, truly want, but that means we kind of have to throw that one out. South Korean state, it is in the constitution of South Korea, which, which claims the entire territory of the Korean Peninsula. It is a duty pursued by every South Korean president, whether they're liberal or conservative, to make some progress toward achieving the ultimate goal, the ultimate dream, which is some kind of breakthrough, whether it comes in a conservative version, which is collapse of the North and absorption by the South, or in a liberal version, which is peacemaking and gradual progress. Um, I, I think you can argue in a, in a different way and in a democratic way, it remains a raison d'etre of the South Korean state uh, and political leadership takes that seriously. And probably the biggest difference is with my dear friend Steve over the South Korean people and what Koreanness means and identity. Uh, my own lived experience, much as I love Korea to my soul, I recognize, Koreans recognize, I'll never be Korean. And it's not just because my spoken Korean is so bad. Uh, there is a ethnic component in the fullest meaning of ethnic, uh, which is not a narrow racial sense, but, but it has a racial dimension to it. Uh, and I think that is still powerfully strong uh, in South Korean society. And part of that identity is ultimately every Korean yearns for reunification. Thank you very much. And since you did uh, explicitly disagree with Stephen, um, it's good that we have him now uh, for his closing um, and final closing statement um, of today. Stephen, please. Thanks, Nico. I accept John's framework and indeed, I think this is the framework we've been working with the North Korean state, South Korean state, North Korean people, South Korean people. Uh, we will concede North Korea, the North Korean states want reunification. We don't need to relitigate that. The South Korean state does indeed state it. Um, and I will, I will quote John when he says, citing the constitution that it is a quote unquote dream. The dream is not something that you legitimately want. It is an aspiration, something perhaps that you work towards, but it is not reality. The people, I think we can all accept that we don't know what North Korean people actually want because we do not have access to them, unfortunately. So I really think that this debate hinges on whether or not you believe the South Korean people want reunification. Um, John says as a longtime resident of the Republic that uh, he cannot be accepted as South Korean. Um, I lived in South Korea myself for nearly a decade for most of my adult life. And uh, I understand that the residual of ethnic nationalism, which would exclude people like John and me, is not absent. It is most certainly something you can determine. But things are changing. Uh, legally, they are changing. There are avenues to be citizens, permanent residents, and full-fledged members of the national community, but also people buy it. Research shows it. Data show it. I want to end on this, the Olympics. I'm surprised we haven't brought this up yet. North and South Korea marching together, people feeling great about possible detente. One thing that I think perhaps got overshadowed was that during the opening ceremony, despite North and South Koreans marching together, in South Korea, the, I, I remember distinctly the, the, the camera pans to a group of multi-racial, multi-ethnic children who are citizens of the Republic singing the South Korean national anthem. That is a creedal nationalism, not completely different from what you'll find in North America and Western Europe. Uh, and that is what determines South Korea today. People do not want reunification. Thank you very, very much, uh, Stephen, Denny. And that concludes the arguments for today's debate, uh, which means it's now, again, your time to vote. Um, and I'm going to start the second poll um, right now. Um, again, the question is the same as in the beginning. Um, do people uh, in North Korea and South Korea, do the governments actually want reunification? Yes, no, or I don't know are your options. Um, I'm going to give this about 45 seconds so all of you uh, can submit your votes and then we'll need a little bit of time to actually tally the results. Um, I see a lot of um, votes are already cast. Some people still uh, need some time. So let's leave the poll open for just a few more seconds. Um, uh, my in the cat meantime, would like to vote. My cat, my cat would like to vote. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, your cat is not registered um, as a participant for the webcast and so cannot vote, um, but we may make an exception. 
Um, all right, um, I think we're there. I think nearly everybody has voted. So let me end the poll here now. Uh, it looks like maybe we need a few more seconds. Um, so let's just- right, By the way, Nico, Nico, our team is not gonna accept uh, the results of the poll unless it's in our favor. I just wanna make that clear now. Okay, okay, good. Uh, how very Trumpian of you. Um, so we do have we do have results now and would ask uh, my colleagues to share the screen. I don't I haven't seen them. So um, let, yeah, I'm seeing what you're seeing. So we see that um, from poll one to poll two, the team arguing in favor of the motion has uh, advanced with 6% from 38 to 44. Um, and the team arguing against the motion from 43 to 36, which is down seven. And of course, this means that the team arguing in favor of the motion has won today's debate. Congratulations, Ji Young Lee. Congratulations, John Delury. Um, you have won the argument today. Thank you very much, Sandra and Stephen, for arguing and fighting valiantly today. This was obviously, as we've seen in the numbers, very, very close. Um, it's a hotly contested and debated issue. Um, but I do hope we were able to shed some light today um, on some of these issues. And I do hope that we would get to welcome you all back. Thank you so much for taking a time out of your busy lives um, at very, very different times of the day, early morning to very late evening. Um, this was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you for joining us. Um, to everybody who's dialed in, we would love and appreciate your feedback on today's event. Um, you will see a feedback form pop up as soon as you leave this conversation. Um, it's also gonna be linked in an email that you will receive in about an hour or so. Um, and anything you wanna tell us um, about what you liked or didn't like about today's debate would be highly appreciated. Um, thank you, ji -Yong. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, John. Thank you, Stephen. Um, talk to you all very soon. Have a wonderful remainder of the day.